All right, so we're going to take a look at the formation of ionic bonds and the formation of ionic compounds and their lovely crystalline structures here. But I'm sure we remember, especially looking at our the world's most famous ionic compound, sodium chloride. This ionic bonding is happening because metals and nonmetals typically are getting together. Metals want to lose their valence electrons, chlorine or nonmetals would like to gain them in an effort to become more stable and essentially trying to get to that full outer shell of valence electrons to be more like the noble gases. So here you see the Bohr models of sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is one electron away from having a full octet, a full valence shell. Sodium has one valence electron and underneath that shell of electrons it has a full octet. So what happens is sodium willingly gives chlorine its valence electron and by doing that that energy level is no longer occupied so it has a full outer shell so does chlorine but by losing that electron sodium becomes a plus one ion chlorine becomes the negative one chloride ion so what we saw there is that sodium's valence electron was transferred to chlorine and we can show that through a uh, equation in which we see the Lewis dot diagrams if you will for the, the Lewis dot symbols for the elements sodium transfers that electron to chlorine and by conventionality we put the negative ion in brackets you could also put the positive ion in brackets if you want but that's typically how that transfer of electrons is shown in an equation form and so what ends up happening of course is that this doesn't happen just one sodium atom with one chlorine atom it happens with billions and billions and billions of them and these ionic compounds form these beautiful crystalline structures here it's a one-to-one -one ion ratio and so that's why we have sodium chloride as the formula unit if it was calcium chloride calcium is a plus two ion we would have twice as many chlorides as calcium ions and we would have a, a slightly different crystal structure now these crystal structures are also very important for some of the ion ionic compound properties that we'll talk about um, mainly being the fact that they're very brittle and if you s hit them they will s fracture very easily cleavage because right now how the crystals are set up the positive and negative ions are surrounding each other and it's a good situation if we chop that just a little bit if we slide it just a little bit by hitting it then you could end up having like charges next to each other and that repulsion force is what splits the crystal apart now if atoms come together and bond there should be a net decrease in energy because the bonded state is typically more stable therefore at a lower potential energy level however when we form ions that action itself is not always energetically favored so if we look at this the ionization of sodium it takes energy to remove an electron from a sodium atom in fact it takes 496 kilojoules per mole now for chlorine to add an electron it's actually you know it releases energy because and that's what the electron affinity is if we add an electron because we know that a chloride ion is much more stable than a chlorine atom so the adding of that electron isn't that big of a deal so what we end up seeing is when these two processes are added together it's 147 kilojoules per mole positive but what ends up happening is that the bond releases more than enough energy to make this situation favorable and worth the quote unquote energy investment that is needed in order to form the ions. Using Coulomb's law and bond length, we this is calculated that it's negative 8.18 times 10 to the negative 19th joules per bond or negative 493 kilojoules per mole. So again, this is how much energy the bond releases in an effort to make up for the investment of that 147 kilojoules per mole that we had to put in to form the ions. And I'm going to show you a diagram here where these numbers all go together 
and perhaps make it a little easier to understand. Now, crystal lattice, this is an important topic. Additional energy is released with the formation of the crystal lattice, the beautiful crystal that sodium chloride makes. Lattice energy is what is called, is the definition of it is the change in energy that occurs when an ionic solid is separated into isolated ions in the gaseous state. So much like when we looked at ionization energy, we had to look at the removing of an electron from a gaseous element. Lattice energy is how much energy it takes to take a crystalline solid, an ionic solid, separate it into the ions in the gaseous phase. So 786 kilojoules per mole it takes for sodium chloride. The opposite of that, the negative of that, if that was negative, that would be the formation of the compound, the crystal lattice energy. And we'll see that here in a minute. So in order to form sodium chloride from sodium and chlorine atoms, overall it's going to be a negative 639 kilojoules per mole experience, the 147 that we invest, and then the 786 that we get back from forming the crystal lattice. So we've seen a lot of these different values, kilojoules per mole, and so let's look at this diagram. This is in our book on page 332, but here we see that one mole sodium, one mole of chlorine at a certain amount of energy. And here's the investment. We have to put in 147 kilojoules in order to get to our sodium and chloride ions. Once we do that, we get 493 kilojoules back by creating the bond we get some additional energy from creating the crystalline structure. The, hold on, sorry, I couldn't find my mouse. The, the crystal lattice, all right? And so here we see then the overall net energy released because we invested the 147, we got 786 back, so we have an overall negative 639 energy released. I think that diagram is pretty helpful to explain all those different numbers we were just looking at. But again, when we form an ionic compound, we must form the ions, and then we get energy back because that crystal lattice is a very, very strong, um, has very, very strong bonds, and those forces, the columbic forces of attraction holding those ions together, is well worth the energy investment to make the ions. Finding the lattice energy experimentally can be quite difficult. So the process is usually done um, by what's called the Born-Haber cycle. And it's similar to when we talked about Hess's law. So in order to obtain the lattice energy for sodium chloride, we look at it through a couple different routes. Okay, first off, solid sodium plus chlorine makes sodium chloride and we can find the delta H of that by using our delta H of formations and when we do that it's negative 411 kilojoules per mole. But realistically we also know that solid sodium has to turn into a gas and lose an electron to become the sodium ion. The chlorine, Cl2, the diatomic molecule, we have to break that bond to get a single chlorine atom and then add an electron to get to the chloride ion. And once that is done, these two ions can come together and then can become the solid sodium chloride. And so just like Hess's law, we can add up these processes, these delta H's. So again, we see sodium solid becoming a gas. And we see the chlorine breaking that bond and then we see the ionization energy of sodium, sorry, and then we see the electron affinity of chlorine, adding the electron. Now we have our ions, and then we put those ions together, and this putting of the ions together is the lattice energy. And so by adding up all the delta H's, 375 kilojoules minus U now we can figure out, because we know from the tables, it's negative 411 kilojoules per mole.
Oops, hold on. And so we see by adding up all those delta H's, 375 minus U equals the negative 411. And there we get the lattice energy, 786 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so again, it's difficult to, ex to experimentally get it directly, which is why we had to use this process, the Born-Haber cycle, in order to find that lattice energy. Another thing that you can put in your pocket and say you're just that much smarter because you know it now. So to sum up, our ionic compounds, they have extremely high melting points because those coulombic forces of attraction holding the ions together are pretty strong. It takes a lot of energy to break them apart to get the compound to become molten. They are typically crystalline solids at room temperature. Lots of cool crystals, structures, and colors. Most of them, however, are white. Typically you see metals and nonmetals in the compound because we need to have the opposite ion charges being held together. Our formula unit, our FUs, show the ratio of ions. Again, we talked about the fact that they are brittle due to the repulsion of like charges when a layer will slide across another and then that's why they fracture pretty easily and they have good what's called cleavage in the, the f mineral fracturing world. Ionic compounds also have low vapor pressure due to these strong columbic interactions of ions. Okay, and again, um, molecular compounds that are solids can have an odor to them. Not all of them, but like mothballs, if you've ever smelled mothballs. Um, something that has high vapor pressure means that it can vaporize pretty easily or sublimate pretty easily if it's a solid. Uh, liquids that have high vapor pressures are what we call volatile and you can smell them. Paint thinner, uh, fingernail polish remover, gasoline. So our ionic compounds have very low vapor pressures because they just don't, the ions just don't vaporize that easily. And when they are, when our ionic compounds are molten or when they're dissolved in water, they will conduct electricity, which is, they're called an electrolyte. In the solid form, they won't do that because the electrons can't pass through. These properties will become pretty important when we do that little lab where we'll be given some different compounds and have to determine whether or not they're molecular or ionic. Hope this helps. See you soon.